Things started to green up a little bit out west. Oh, very much so. We'll see what the six inches of snow does for us. Did you get that or that's what it's calling for? <laughs> they're calling up it towards the Nebraska line. They're calling for three to six inches. Yeah. No, I heard on the Nebraska Nebraska line, but I <laughs> I was about to say for your area, I didn't hear about that. They're 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 saying a trace to three, even wow. down to, um south as I am. Fair enough. Wow. Yeah, they're saying out of northwest, like the northwest corner, three to six inches. Tonight, I think after midnight. It like loops down closer to Great Bend than I'm comfortable with. <laughs> it, it's not going to stay on the ground. Um, I mean, it's going to be gone that, uh, that day, but still. Yeah, it's all supposed to come down as rain for us tomorrow, so. Um, which would be okay. Most of the countryside is black right now after uh, burning this week, so that'll be a nice little. It'll be cool. Hopefully, get some of the uh, some of that rain will soak in, and uh, hopefully, we can get some good growth coming back. That would be good. We've actually had decent moisture this spring, without the tornadoes or hail that normally go with it. Better knock on some wood there. Yeah, my, uh, my place got hammered with two inch hail uh, last fall. So uh, that's, <laughs> I get it. Well, everyone, um, for attending, we are going to get started in about a minute or two. Um, we found that most people get on right at 10 o'clock, so we'll give everybody a couple more minutes to um, be able to attend, and then we will get started. Hey everyone, um, we would like to welcome you to round two, um, the third installment of round two of Kato Conversations. Um, we want to thank you guys for coming. This is once again a collaboration with K-State Research and Extension Districts. We've got Central Kansas District, Cottonwood District, Midway, Post Rock, and River Valley that are all represented here. Um, next, I'd like to introduce all of the agents that have made this possible. Um, first of all, I am Alicia Bohr. I'm an agriculture agent for the Cottonwood District. Um, then we've got Justine Henderson. She's the livestock agent for the Central Kansas District. Clint Laughlin is the livestock agent for the Midway District. Brett Melton is a livestock agent for River Valley. And then we have Sandra Wick, who is kind of an anomaly, I guess. Um, she's a crop production agent, but she is fantastic and has taken over um, for the time being the livestock um, ooh, duties as well. So we thank her for being able to be multitasking at this time. So um, when you are asking a question, um, if you would just like to, at the very bottom, you will see the chat function. You can submit your questions into the chat and we will all be able to see them and answer them either during the um, program or at the very end. It just depends on um, the rhythm of the meeting at the time. So you can also, if for some reason that doesn't work, you can email your questions to swick, that's S-W-I-C-K, at ksu.edu, or any of us agents if you have a question you can't get it through on the chat. Um, we will have one poll question coming through. Um, when we pop it up, um, you'll see it in the middle. 
and just put uh, pick on your answer. We do not see who chose what answer. So just feel free to answer the questions as they come on. Um, and with that, I will be happy to introduce our speaker for today. This is AJ Tarpoff. He is our beef extension veterinarian um, that works closely with the state's extension teams to develop programs to improve the health of cow-calf, stalker, and feedlot cattle for beef producers throughout the state. Um, today is about pasture lameness and that it is not always what you are um, may think at the beginning. So um, with that, AJ, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. You should be able to share your screen at this moment. There we go. AJ, you are muted. Yes, I am. So thank you for that. Uh, can everybody hear me okay and see the slide all right? I'm backwards, AJ. Okay. Now oh, the joys of running a uh, dual screen. That should be uh, coming through better. Okay, perfect. All right, well, let's kick everything off today. And uh, that's right, let's, uh, let's talk about lameness. Uh, lameness has kind of been a, uh, uh, something I've, I, I've always focused on, uh, both when I was in practice, uh, working with clients and producers to, to really kind of uh, get a better handle on some of our, our lameness issues, whether it's uh, in a dirt lot or whether it's out in the pasture, this is something that everybody deals with. And this whole presentation was built upon the idea of making better better diagnosing decisions at first. So that way we get better treatment outcome uh, because a lot of these conditions may not be our, our typical foot rot issue uh, and they may not be responsive. So the sooner that we can get uh, the, the, the accurate diagnosis and accurate treatment, uh, the better outcome to get those animals back into production. So that's our goals today. So uh, my, my personal opinion, and I and I, a lot of veterinarians and a lot of a lot of folks uh, share this sentiment is uh, lameness may be one of the biggest opportunities for improvement in the beef cattle industry uh, as a whole. Okay, this is something we all manage, uh, but we do see significant losses. We have an economic impact, and it, it has also been a major uh, key point of focus for a lot of our other. Um, meat animal industries, okay, uh, both on the dairy, the swine, the poultry, lameness has been a very key aspect when it comes to animal welfare and, and, and the well-being of our animals. Um, you know, beef, we've seen issues as well. We had fatigue cattle syndrome with some of the finished cattle going to slaughter, uh, you know, made a lot of different headlines. We understood a little bit more about that, where we had animals that uh, would, you know, would lay down, they were fatigued, they appeared lame. Uh, but we see lameness in a lot of other aspects, okay? And, and one, one kind of key thing to think about is uh, lameness is also very visual, okay? It, it, some of these lameness conditions, they can pop up suddenly or they can be completely normal one day and be uh, three-legged lame the next. And, you know, from the untrained observer, you know, driving by, seeing an animal that is, uh, you know, very lame, uh, even though the treatment and the response can be very quick, um, you know, we can see really good things. It, it's, it's a very visual thing that says, well, what's going on on that operation if they have lame animals out in this pasture, you know? So it's always something to keep in the back of your mind, okay? Uh, so lameness estimates, uh, this is some older data. This is more, uh, you know, uh, more oriented for, uh, the, for the feedlot and some of the economics, some of our best economic uh, information that we do have from the feedlot. Uh, but it's, it's been estimated up to upwards to 16% of all animals that get treated are treated for some type of lameness. Uh, it does, uh, you know, equate to some of our mortality issues, uh, but most importantly, one of our biggest losses are animals that, uh, you know, really need to get cold, okay? So whether that's uh, coal from the herd uh, for a lameness issue, whether this is a, a railer issue at the, at the feedlot where we have a lameness that it can no longer perform up, up to its potential, and it, it has been debilitated enough that it's still safe for human consumption, but it's not going to be able to finish uh, with the rest of the animals within its pen. Uh, so that's a really kind of a recoup of some of the purchase cost, and, and we see these issues, okay? We see it in cow-calf operations with uh, having to cull animals that have been lame. Uh, 
Uh, these are real tangible losses that impact our industry economically. Uh, some of the feedlot data, like I said, they, you know, we have a lot more economic data on that. Uh, that it, it's been tallied up that every time you have to treat an animal for lameness at the feedlot, it, when we spread those costs over the entire yard, uh, when we look at, uh, you know, labor, uh, cost of treatment, loss of production, when we put all of that together, uh, one animal that gets treated can be a loss to the feedlot for upwards to $100. Okay, so uh, that, that's real, that's tangible. So, you know, what, what type of information do we have on? What, what's the prevalence? How often do we deal with it? Uh, relatively speaking, uh, you know, for total numbers of animals that get placed, you know, a little under 2% of animals may, may come down with uh, some type of lameness concern. Okay, it's obviously our, our biggest threat would be uh, bovine respiratory disease, okay, pneumonia. However, lameness uh, does creep up and it, it is a key component of disease issues we see in the cattle industry. Um, so yes, we know it's there. We know it's a concern. Uh, how, how do we start working our way through this? And that's really what we're going to talk about. Okay, early treatment yields success. Regardless of what we're doing, we can treat these animals appropriately the first time. They will respond rapidly, get back to regular production, and it minimizes any of the potential losses that, that, that our operations can have. Okay, remember, Cattle are a prey species. They want to hide illness. They want to hide lameness. They like to hide within the herd, okay? Uh, they always don't like to uh, show all their symptoms, okay? And so think about it. I mean, I, a lot of us are guilty of this. When we go out uh, with cattle on pasture, they're all, uh, you know, it's the middle of the day. They're all uh, laying down underneath, the, you know, some shade trees out in the middle of the pasture. We go out and we check cows, right? We check stalkers. We're going to have a look at everything. Make sure nobody is outwardly sick, okay? Uh, making sure that we have an accurate count. But often when we go out and do this, we don't necessarily get all of our animals up within that pasture and watch them move, okay? And those animals that are lame, obviously they're gonna be laying down a uh, vast majority of the time and they can hide uh, either within the group or hide their lameness just by not getting up. And we don't outwardly think that there's any issues because they look outwardly normal. They look at, you know, they look healthy until they start moving. Okay. And I, so it's always something to think about that, you know, early treatment yields success, but we also have to find them early. Uh, so it's also a key point to make sure that we see these animals in motion as often as we can. Uh, so real quick, you don't have to read all this by, by any means, but there was a nice survey that was done by uh, some colleagues several years back uh, here at K-State that actually asked a lot of people, um, you know, how do you diagnose lameness? Okay, uh, what tools do you have at your disposal? And uh, not surprisingly, the, the biggest tool that we have at our disposal is visualization. Okay, looking, looking at the feet, looking at the joints, looking at the legs, something is abnormal. We see some lameness. So the visualization is really critical. Okay, well, where should our eyesight kind of key into for lameness? And th this one should not be surprising. Most of our lameness concerns in cattle stems from the foot, okay? The foot is what comes in contact with the ground. That's what, uh, that is what's being done. Um, you know, most of our lameness, up to 90% stems from the feet, okay? Of those lamenesses, 80% stem from the back feet, okay? And a lot of this has to do with the locomotion of, of cattle. And so I think it's always good to understand the front feet, are, are made and designed for holding weight, okay? And that, that's what the bovine does. The rear feet are meant for locomotion, okay? So the front are for directional changes, turning and holding weight. The back feet are for locomotion and driving power, okay? Uh, so when we think about the, the, you know, the big round, the big back legs, the big muscle structures of those rear legs, that's what gives these animals the force to be able to move. Okay, every time they turn, it does put pressure and causes friction on those back feet because that's the key driving force. We have the most forces on those back legs. And because of that, and the way that they turn, the outside toe on the back feet often yields the most lameness issues. Okay, and that has to do with the locomotion and the grinding and the driving force of those back feet. The outside lateral toe, the outside toe on the back feet is what yields the most force. So that's where we'll see most of our problems, okay? 
So let's go through some uh, proper diagnosis. That's really what we're here, here to talk about today. And we'll talk about several of these. Uh, foot rot, infect, uh, deep infections, things that are more sinister. And that's really the key, key aspects to pick up from today is, is how do I troubleshoot whenever I see a lame animal? Where do I look? What should I look for? What should send off triggers in our minds that says, hey, this might be a little bit more sinister. We may have to look into this a little bit deeper, okay? So this is where it starts. We see a lame animal in the pasture, okay? We have that animal up and, and moving. We can see that they're obviously lame. The first question to ask, is there swelling? Okay, yes or no? Very simple. Is there swelling coming from the leg that they're lame on? Okay, uh, then it's isolating. Where is the swelling? Is it in the foot? Is it in a joint? Is, do we see something very abnormal? Thankfully, we have an exact replica of a normal foot right on the other side of the animal. So we have a good comparison. Is there swelling? Where is the swelling? Okay, those are the first two. Then the final question, which of course, this is a big exam, right? We have three, three questions to ask about lameness. Is there swelling? Where's the swelling? Is the swelling symmetrical? Is it equal on both sides of the leg or the foot or the joint? Okay, or is it only located in one location? Okay, so that's the last key question. And we'll talk about some of those things. Okay, so those are the three key questions. Now let's get into individual diseases. Okay, one that I'm sure all of you are very comfortable with and have seen before, foot rot. Okay, foot rot is not just any lame animal or any animal that's uh, carrying a leg. Okay, foot rot is a very specific disease process. There's a lot of really fancy terms that get thrown around for foot rot, like interdigital necrobacillosis. Uh, that's always a fun one, or interdigital phlegmon. Um, anyway, I never, hey, we never refer to any of these. The, refer to it by any of these names. Names. It's, it's foot rot, right? And foot rot is a bacterial issue, okay? It's caused by fusobacterium. Fuso is a very common bacteria found in the environment, found in the manure. It's passed, it's naturally found in the dig digestive tract. Uh, interesting to note that fuso actually causes liver abscesses as, as well in feeder cattle. Um, also, it can cause some things like laryngitis where they uh, you know, they're, they're wheezers. They're, it, we have a laryngitis up in the back of the throat. That, this same bug can cause all of these disorders, uh, liver abscesses, laryngitis, and foot rot. Um, but thankfully for our cattle, they have a very powerful barrier known as the skin, okay? The skin keeps out all these natural uh, bacteria that are found in the environment, keeping any of these infections from occurring. But in order for foot rot to occur, we have to have a breakdown in that skin barrier, okay? We have an abrasion. They ran through a sticker bush and got a thorn stuck in there. We had some breakdown, okay? Or we got a piece of rock. They were standing in a pond and a rock got stuck between the toes and it rubbed, okay? Anything that can abrase or break down that skin barrier can lead to foot rot. What happens is the bacteria, Fuso, goes in through these abrasions and it starts to pr uh, proliferate. So it, it's growing in numbers. When it does that, it causes a localized bacterial infection just underneath the skin or subcutaneously. And when it does that, it actually releases these toxins. Uh, so the toxins that it releases are very immunogenic. That just means the body really responds. We get swelling. We get a massive amount of swelling in a re relatively short amount of time. Uh, so very reactive once this process starts. Um, we will see noticeable lameness, but the one key aspect of foot rot that all of us, I'm sure, are kind of going through your head right now if you've seen these, is the smell. It's a very pungent odor that it, 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 it's very distinctive, okay? It's pungent. It kind of burns your nostrils whenever you can smell it, especially up close. Um, so, I mean, so, so whenever we're diagnosing issues, we're using all of our senses. Yes, we're using our eyes. Yes, we're moving these animals and visualizing. Uh, but don't, don't forget about our other senses, okay? If you come downwind of our herds and get everybody up to start moving and you catch the smell of a, that pungent odor of, of, of prototypical foot rot, uh, that's where we go to work. That's where we start sorting off animals and making sure, okay, the smell is coming from somewhere. Where are they, okay? Uh, so we can never forget about that pungent odor. Uh, interesting for foot rot, which makes it easier to diagnose, is we have symmetric swelling, Okay. So the swelling itself, we have an abrasion usually on the inside, in between the toes, 
That's where we have gain, gain of entry. After that bacteria starts to seed and we have the infection, the first area we will see swelling is right on the back side of the hook. That's the easiest place for swelling to go. As it progresses, the toes will separate, okay, where we have equal swelling above the hook walls, but equal on that lower area of the foot. Okay, we have a broken skin, usually in between the toes. We have that foul pungent odor. Um, and that, that's really what we see. And what I mean by symmetric, okay, if we draw a line straight in between the two toes, we have symmetric swelling on both sides, okay, between the, ho uh, the hooves up to the fetlock. That's where we will see the vast majority of our, our, of our swelling, okay? So that's foot rot. That's the disease process. We have a bacterial infection under the skin, releasing toxins, leading to uh, massive amounts of inflammation, pain, swelling, all of the above, okay? What, what we see is lame animals. We, we smell the pungent odor. Uh, antibiotic treatment is warranted for, for foot rot, okay? Um, so yes, we have many labeled options that are available, and I'll talk a little bit about that here in a second, uh, but we usually treat our foot rot cases with injectable antibiotics, systemic antibiotics. Uh, we're able to get uh, large volumes uh, through the bloodstream into that inflammation area to be able to resolve these issues rather quickly, okay, which is very nice. That's one good, good, good thing that we have is for our regular foot rot issues that when we get uh, early treatment, uh, they do respond pretty rapidly, okay? It is a painful condition, okay? And a lot of people may ask about pain control and what do we have uh, at our disposal? Well, re uh, recently, within the last couple of years, we have, there's actually a new product on the market that has a label specifically for the pain of foot rot. Um, and that is a, a, a topical transdermal uh, banami product. It's the only one that actually has a label for pain of foot rot or pain for anything for, uh, for uh, cattle, okay? So it's pretty novel in, in that ability. So we do have an option that's labeled for pain of foot rot, okay? So that's why I like to, it's, we pour that down the top line uh, and can have pretty good effect for, uh, for a little over a day up to 48 hours. Um, now, some folks may have asked, and I, I get this question occasionally, well, uh, boy, that's, it's swelling. Why don't we use a steroid to help decrease some of the swelling, okay? Uh, common steroids we may use in, in, in beef cattle or cattle in general may be dexamethasone. Uh, the concern with using dexamethasone is it can be immunosuppressive, okay, where it basically dumbs down the immune system, okay? Well, when we're dealing with a bacterial issue, sometimes we have to balance that. Uh, you know, the, back, the antibiotic only works as well as the immune system is working at the same time. Okay, when we're battling some of these disease conditions, sometimes it's counterintuitive to give a steroid uh, when we need the immune system to be kicking in and working with our antibiotic to help heal the condition. Okay, so a concern about use of steroids would be the immunosuppressive results. Uh, that, that would be inadvertent, but it, it very much does happen. Okay, uh, timing. When we treat an animal for foot rot, we should see almost complete resolution within a week, okay? That's when we treat them early. If we treat them early, we should see these recover and, and see uh, drastic decreases in lameness within just a, a couple of days, two or three days, and they're, they're off to the races. Um, if we don't have very well resolution within about a week, something more sinister could be going on, okay? Uh, now, I, I say that with a grain of salt because if we are late in our treatment, if we have a club foot, Okay, a club foot is a big nasty, you know, big swelling, big going on for multiple days, uh, even up to a week. True club foots means the infection has gotten deeper into the, the lower tissues. And in the foot, there's not a whole lot of tissue to, to, to protect our, to, you know, to protect our, ourselves from. We have the skin, we have connective tissue, we have bone, we have joints, okay, and we have tendons. That's, a, that's really all that's there. If we get infection into those lower, uh, lower tissues like bone joints or tendon sheets, uh, it, it, it's much more difficult to treat. And those are very, very much more sinister. Okay, so it, it's always good to keep in mind. Uh, so this is a picture of a bull uh, with a very severe foot rot. Okay, this, is, this would be more accustomed to our club foot. Okay, uh, where it basically looks like a big bam bam club and because the swelling is so bad. Uh, we obviously have the breakdown in between the toes. 
but this would be, you know, this would be a, a longer term foot rot. It's, this did not pop up overnight. This is uh, this animal, this bull had been dealing with it for a little bit more time. Uh, would this resolve within a week after a regular antibiotic treatment? Absolutely not. Okay, this would be more of our long term treatments uh, to try to get this back, this animal back up to uh, productivity. So what are, our, what are our antibiotic choices? Obviously, the first thing to do is, is contact and work with your local practicing veterinarian, okay? Uh, each of them may have uh, slightly different recommendations, and that's okay because we have a lot of options at our disposal that are all very effective when it comes to treating foot rot. Uh, we have our oxytetracyclines, okay? This, these would be our LAs, our biomyosins, our uh, oxytet. You know, it's, uh, the, these are... Uh, the injectable formulations uh, all have a label for uh, for foot rot, okay, and all uh, give good duration and will respond uh, pretty quick. Uh, there are some older bolus products that are uh, not used quite as commonly, just because they're more difficult to give. Um, then we have some Septia Pure products. We have uh, we have Fluorphenicol, which would be New Floor. We have Tulathromycin, which is Draxin. Uh, so obviously, there's a big cost differential on, on some of these treatments, but uh, may be chosen for some specific reasons or another. And many of these are only by prescription only from your veterinarians. That's why it's, it's critical to be able to have that discussion to understand what your options are when, when you go to treat. So what about prevention? Well, if this is a bacterial infection, why don't we just vaccinate for it? Well, that's a great question uh, and a great comment that usually always comes up. Well, why don't we just vaccinate for it? Well, uh, we do have a commercial vaccine that is available. It's called FusoGuard. It's labeled for foot rot and also for uh, help, help in control of liver abscesses. Uh, the issue with uh, FusoGuard is, it, it is uh, the bacteria itself is very difficult to build a meaningful uh, you know, vaccine for. We can see some efficacy, uh, but it, it's, it's not perfect. Okay, so we have to have a realistic expectation on what it does. Uh, there's been a lot of peer reviewed uh, papers and research that's been done on this. Uh, out of all of them, there's really only one Canadian feedlot study that saw an effect, but not, not on grain based diets, only on uh, forage based diet, diets when it came to the uh, foot rot prevalence. Okay, so Obviously, we don't have a ton of information. There's con some conflicting results in the literature, whether it's uh, highly efficacious or not. A lot of producers and a lot of veterinarians do use this just kind of as an, as an additive into their operation, just to, as a little extra insurance. Okay, so it's available. We don't necessarily uh, know exactly how much efficacy we have, but it is in use. So I do want to make sure that you're uh, aware. Uh, that some control measures may, may include some uh, usage of the vaccine. Uh, however, there are limitations, just so you're, you're aware of that. Uh, foot baths. Question often comes up, if, especially if anybody that's been involved with the dairy industry at all, uh, foot baths are very common in the dairy. Okay, those animals walk through a foot bath on a daily basis that helps take care of a lot of these issues, but they don't see the regular foot rot. Uh, using a foot, a foot bath in a pasture setting or a feedlot or anything is extremely challenging. I've tried, okay? So it's not really practical to be able to do that. And the animals would have to go, go through those uh, almost on a daily basis to have any real efficacy, which is not practical in our, our cow-calf or our background or stocker or, or feedlot operations. So our main preventative is environmental control for foot rot, okay? Uh, mud, manure, wet conditions, all of these things can be detrimental to the skin health of, the, of those feet. Okay, one of the key areas that I see most of the issues uh, whenever dealing with uh, increasing prevalence of foot rot is ponds. Okay, ponds are a tremendous water source for our livestock out in pasture settings. However, when it gets hot, they have flies around them. They go stand in the pond, stand in the mud. We get softening of the skin. Whenever they get out, either they're uh, tracking up uh, gravel uh, in between those toes where we already have a softened uh, hide, softened skin in between the toes, they've been macerated by standing in water for long periods of time. And then we grind in a, a small piece of gravel or some uh, dirt and long and behold, now we have foot rot. Okay, it happens very commonly. Uh, there, obviously there's some things that we can do to increase the, uh, uh, the stability of our watering areas for around our ponds that uh, you know, we can have some improved watering locations, which uh, KSRE has some tremendous resources available for that. Uh, but again, standing in ponds, standing around water troughs where it gets really muddy, 
uh, really deep you know, where they're stomping through some mud in some of those locations, even in pastures, uh, can be some key areas that we can kind of upgrade to help minimize the impacts on, on the feet of these animals. Okay, so that's basic foot rot. Okay, so good overview. What about this guy? Is this symmetric? Is this swelling symmetric? Uh, thinking back to the picture that I had previously, we have a normal toe right here, and then we have this big bump over here. This is not symmetric. This is not regular foot rot. We see a swelling, they're very lame, but uh, this, is not, this is not the same. It's a different disease process. Let's get into that. What does it look like? Here's a bowl that's in a chute. Uh, we can see these swellings from the front or the back, okay? But once we notice the lameness here, we can see the spreading of the dew claws, spreading of the, uh, the back of the heel bolts, okay? We can see the big swelling that's unilateral, only on one side. Okay, so we have a one side of this foot that is more affected than the other. Okay, this should uh, raise some red flags. Something a little bit more sinister is at work here. Okay, this, this is something that we would need to address differently than how we address foot rot. Okay, so to, to help with this, again, just another visual. Foot rot, we have equal swelling on both sides. When we have deeper tissue infections, either from a joint, uh, a bone, uh, or some of the under, underlying tendon sheath or tendon itself, we will see unilateral, one-sided swelling, okay? Now, where do these deep infections come from? Uh, could have been from a puncture wound, could have been from a chronic foot rot condition where we got infection into the deeper tissues. It could have stemmed from the foot itself. And oftentimes it does, that we started with a sole bruise that turned into a sole abscess, and then that infection spread to up uh, either deeper tissues or up the leg, okay? So deep sole abscesses and sole bruises and ulcers uh, can also lead to some of these deep infections. Uh, they typically will not heal until we get drainage from some of those key areas, okay? Um, they Usually that, that means that we may have to pair out abscesses. We would have to do some footwork. Uh, to make sure that we can get relief to those areas to allow the, the hoof to heal itself, okay? Uh, obviously, if it gets into the joints or tendons, uh, your veterinarian may have some other tools to be able to debride or basically clean those. Uh, but these are these definitely warrant a call to a, a, a veterinarian. Uh, these deep infections don't heal on their own, okay? Uh, even with proper therapy can take some time to get them back to soundness, okay? But we can do it whenever we get treatment uh, indicated as early as possible, okay? That, and that may be some sedation, going on a tilt shoot if it, it's available, uh, lay the animal down and we start working and may use grinders and may use uh, pairing knives like we do on horses hooves uh, to be able to pair out some of those uh, abscesses and infection to allow it to heal from the inside out. Uh, we can also put on some, uh, some blocks to make these animals more comfortable and to be able to walk, uh, or it's a salvage situation. Okay, and I'll kind of walk through those. Uh, here's an example of pairing out some uh, nasty abscess that's underneath the, uh, underneath the hoof wall, uh, underneath the sole. This is a sole abscess that can occur from, start from a bruise that gets bacteria in there and long, long and behold, we end up with an abscess. Uh, will not heal on so, okay, without pairing that out. Uh, here's an example that once we do some of these, uh, this hoof work, we can actually uh, use uh, different types of uh, specialized epoxy uh, that we can actually glue these blocks onto the other hoof. Uh, this takes all the pain and all the strain away, and they, they actually walk out of the chute, and they, they're very comfortable. Hopefully, we can get those blocks to stay on uh, for a couple weeks, even upwards to a month. And when we do that, it, it takes away the pain and gives us an opportunity to heal uh, the affected toe, okay? And they can be very, very successful whenever, whenever we can utilize these. Uh, but again, not all of these can heal. Okay, here's an example. This is an x-ray, uh, believe it or not, of a bovine hoof. And what we see here, we have an infection in the bone. Okay, so the bone has basically eaten away at itself from the infection. Uh, this is a very serious situation that uh, no, no amount of uh, systemic antibiotic is going to be able to heal this. Okay, we already have a compromised, uh, you know, structure of that foot. Uh, so there are some other options we can get animals by. This is an amputation, okay? This is a surgical amputation to actually remove that hoof as a salvage procedure. Uh, that can be done in certain animals, um, you know, especially our mature animals, whether it's a cow and we need to get her uh, through calving. 
uh, or it's a bull and we need to be able to get him collected or uh, be able to, you know, do some different things. Uh, you know, this is a salvage procedure. It's not for the long term. If we have to do an amputation on a toe, um, you know, it can get us by for several months, uh, even upwards to a year. But past that, especially larger animals, larger cows and bulls, we can actually have some uh, deeper tissue breakdown on this other toe. Uh, so it is a salvage procedure, but can definitely relieve the infection, get the animal back to production, uh, at least in the short term. Okay, either to get through a pregnancy, get through a lactation, uh, something along those lines. Okay, so that, that is one type of deep, uh, deep infection that we see, but we see another type of, uh, of deep infection. And it's, it's, uh, it's been termed toe tip necrosis, uh, where we actually have breakdown in between the sole and the bottom of the foot and the hoof wall that comes down, the white line, so to speak, and we can get abrasion and actually breakdown where we allow bacteria to get inside that toe and it forms an abscess right at the tip of the toe and as it progresses will cause an infection in the bone inside that hoof wall okay uh, these are pretty serious we often see these more with uh, calves and yearlings okay uh, that have uh, been shipped in if you're going to run some grass cattle um, usually see them soon after arrival Okay, predisposing uh, factors for this a lot of times has to do with temperament, uh, temperament, cattle handling, and facilities. Okay, uh, whether it's been uh, you know they've stood on concrete, they've ground them, they're they're uh, really flighty, they get into a group and they grind their hooves. Uh, all of these can potentiate the you know the, the issue of having toe tip necrosis or toe abscesses. Um, so again, usually our back feet on the outside toe is where we run into toe uh, toe. Uh, abscess issues in some of our feeder, in some of our young growing animals. Uh, so again, transportation, rough concrete footing, flighty animals, uh, poor handling techniques where they're very flighty and they're, um, you know, we get handlers too close, we can see some of these issues. Other issues where we can run into this is uh, more of our own fault, not just flightiness of the animals, but facilities. Uh, and I, I, you know, this is just kind of a generic picture of the inside of a sheep. Uh, but oftentimes broken welds, uh, step ups where we have a, a flat piece of metal that almost acts as a wave and broken welds on the floorboards of our, our shoot systems uh, can really act as a wave and, and just shave off areas of hoof uh, that we often don't notice until we have lameness issues. Uh, so it's always a good idea to, to clean up and make sure that we, uh, we really address any type of breakdown, any type of broken welds, any type of uh, issues that we have with our uh, shoot systems themselves to make sure that they are not potentially harming our animals as they go through. So toe abscesses, these are a little bit more difficult to diagnose, okay? Usually freshly arrived animals that have been recently handled is where we see these most commonly. They've been through an auction facility, they've been on a truck, uh, they've been recently handled, and this is what we see. Little to no swelling, very odd shifting lameness, very aggressive cattle because they are in severe pain. Usually it's the outside rear toe that is affected. So these animals will stand very funny. They stand to protect that toe. They will stand with their back legs very spread apart to only put weight on the inside toe or their back legs will actually be crossed. That is very abnormal. Animals should not stand with their back legs crossed they do that to try to relieve pressure. Once that abscess forms inside the hoof wall, it's basically if, if anybody's slammed their thumb with a hammer and that throbbing feeling, well, that's what they feel with this abscess on the inside. Then imagine trying to walk on that. Uh, so again, a very painful situation. So they walk to protect the toe um, and often shift how they stand. They can't get comfortable. Okay. Um, how, how we can, we, we, this is a situation where we'll pick up the foot uh, we will isolate which toe is affected, and we can do that with hook testers. And here I've got a picture of, uh, you know, with a simple nylon rope and maybe a little pulley and maybe a little uh, metal clasp. We can uh, run them into a chute. We can pull that leg up, tie it to the side, and we can get clear diagnosis. We can take hook testers and we uh, test right at the tip of the toe. Uh, it, toes that are affected, they will be very painful. The animal will pull its foot back immediately. Uh, that's where we can isolate and we know exactly which toe to, to, to work on. How we train, uh, uh, trim these is we'll actually use hoof nippers and just open up the tip of the toe. 
uh, it's amazing the, the animals, the pressure that can build up with the abscess material that it can shoot a couple of feet whenever you open these up. I've, uh, I've done an enormous amount of training with feedlot uh, employees on, on handling these and proper treatment. We want just enough to relieve the pressure for death, uh, not enough to really cause bleeding. Okay, we, do, we just want enough to open up the tip of the toe to allow drainage out. Okay, uh, just because we opened it uh, doesn't mean that they're always going to heal appropriately. Okay, so there, there is some risk associated. Um, if we find them early and we treat them, we open the toe and we treat them with systemic antibiotics and we let them rest and recover. If we do everything right, we might have 50% 50, uh, 50 success. Okay, if we don't open the toe, none of them will heal. Uh, the infection and the picture on the right is the picture of a, a, a hoof uh, that, that was split down the center with a bandsaw. This is part of a uh, research project. Um, but we will. Get, this is the lower bone. It's all infected. It's called osteomyelitis. Once that happens, the infection gets systemic and it's uh, not a good deal. Animals will, will deteriorate. Uh, this is an animal I euthanized right after I took that picture, but it had toe abscesses and the infections were coming up the leg. Um, so yes, it, it can be very debilitating, but uh, with pr uh, prudent treatment, we can get quite a few of these animals over it. So the biggest thing, since treatment isn't super successful, uh, we really need to focus on prevention. And that's uh, facilities, uh, that's non-abrasive alleyways, making sure that we aren't causing the issue, okay? so. Last couple slides, okay? So arthritis, now is the time we've got uh, for spring calving herds. Uh, they're going out into, uh, um, you know, heading out to grass. Maybe we occasionally see some pneumonia issues in some of our calves out in pasture, uh, whether on the cow-calf side or for the stalker, uh, you know, grazer operation. Uh, we have an issue called septic arthritis, okay? So septic arthritis is a bacterial arthritis. And the bugs that are associated, you know, not newborns, okay? Newborns are one thing that that comes through navel ill and, and things like that. But uh, out in pasture, they, you know, a couple of months of age all the way up through, uh, through and past weaning. Um, this septic arthritis issue usually occurs after a bout of respiratory disease. So they will break with pneumonia. We will treat them for pneumonia. They look great. And about seven to 10 days later, they show up lame with a very big joint, okay? The bugs that are associated with it are uh, Staphylococcus and Mycoplasma, which are also causes of respiratory disease. These bugs get systemic and they float through the bloodstream and they can get seeded into these, uh, these joints, which is kind of a protected space. And that, that's where they stick, okay? Uh, so again, we see septic arthritis after a bout of respiratory disease. Definitely not foot rot. Okay, very different disease process. Um, we can see multiple joints affected. We can see hocks, we can see carpi, we can see elbows, uh, we can see stifles, hips. Uh, this is a polyarthritis, okay? A good rule of thumb, and this is what the joints look like themselves. Uh, a good rule of thumb, if you have more than one joint on more than one leg, the animal will get condemned at slaughter. Okay, more than one joint affected on more than one leg, the animal will be condemned. So if you're thinking about selling these or trying to take them to a commercial slaughter as a railer, that's a good rule of thumb to work on, uh, on what, if they need to leave your operation, if they can. Uh, so treatment for these is often systemic antibiotics. Systemic therapy is often what we use. Okay, uh, remember mycoplasma doesn't have a cell wall. So some of our antibiotics inherently will not work against mycoplasma. Uh, those would be things like penicillins and cephalofloxacins, which would be uh, Exceed, XNL, and Axel. Uh, those products. Uh, those products actually work specifically against the cell wall of bacteria. Uh, and if mycoplasma is involved, we're not going to have any effect. Okay. Uh, and when we treat, when we treat appropriately, we can we can take care of the bacteria. Okay, with with proper therapy. The issue becomes the animal still has to resolve all this inflammation material, all this. Uh, yellow stuff that was in, in the joint. This is all inflammatory cells that have been brought into the joint to try to heal. Well, that doesn't go away overnight. Since the joint's a protected space, it takes a long time to resorb that back into the body. Uh, so even after treatment, this is kind of a rest and recover animal that may take a month, 45 days to be able to get back to regular production. 
Okay, so be ready to handle some of those circumstances. They probably won't be able to move quite as well with the rest of the group. They're in treatment. They, it's just kind of a rest and recover. So here's the, uh, I'm gonna set up a scenario and we're gonna have a quick question for everybody that's on. So this is an example of an animal. Uh, you go out and look at a group and this animal is painful. It is three-legged lame. It's trying to put its foot down, but it's holding its foot up will not put any weight on this on this uh, this foot. There's no swelling, no swelling whatsoever, okay? We go and, if this is a front foot, we go and grab this animal and we get a closer examination. We see this bright red appearance right on the back of the hook wall, uh, right, right on the back of the uh, the heel bones. We see this, this kind of red rosy appearing tissue. What is it? What's your best idea of what this is? So I, I will let, uh, I will let Alicia go ahead and put up the uh, the poll. You guys could just uh, real quickly do uh, do a quick poll if this is a uh, foot rod, a heel bruise, a tendon infection, or hairy heel wounds. Again, thank you for uh, contributing to that. I'll let uh... everybody has uh, voted now. Okay, what were the results? Heel bruise, okay, fair enough. Well, this is actually not a heel bruise. This is a, an infection, uh, infectious condition. And it also goes, often goes misdiagnosed. We don't recognize it, especially on the beef side. It's called hairy heel warts or strawberry foot rot, or also goes by digital dermatitis, okay? No swelling, extremely painful. It is known to be contagious. We don't know exactly how this disease starts or how it progresses. We are learning more and more about it. There are researchers that are doing research on it all over the world. Um, it has traditionally been a dairy issue, but we are seeing it at the feedlot. We're seeing it on the cow calf. Uh, it does pop up. Okay, so that's why I like to bring it up. It's actually, uh, we, we believe that it's caused by a bacteria known as a spirochete. Um, so we just think that because we find it whenever we look at these lesions, uh, whenever they get sent into the diagnostic lab. Um, the pre patent period is very strange. These animals can be exposed to whatever initiates this disease process, and it may take months before they actually break with any type of clinical signs. And what we'll see is usually associated with the back of the heel, okay, we will have lesions that uh, progress. They will be bright red, rosy, like that previous picture. Uh, they, will, they can be black. Uh, they can look, have like wart-like, finger-like projections that are very painful. Uh, it's just an overgrowth of that external area of the skin. So digital dermatitis, it, it is emerging, okay? Bright red lesion on the back or almost looking like a, a wart, or uh, a scab on the back of the, the, the heel bones, okay? Because of this, and it's so painful that even poking it is very painful. So what they do is they're reluctant to walk on it, so they walk on the very tip of their toe. If you see animals walking on the tip of their toe, should uh, raise a red flag that potentially we're dealing with a hairy heel wart, okay? So, uh, so very painful, can be multiple, uh, multiple feet, uh, but usually it's only one at a time, but can be. Uh, so what we see is walking on the tip of the toe. And this is what we'll see. They'll, uh, whenever they're moving, they're very lame, but they only put pressure on the tip of their toe just from this little lesion on the back side of their hook. It's amazing how uh, just such a small lesion can be so painful, but it, it really is. And this is one of the, one of the key differences with Harry Heel War. Systemic uh, antibiotic therapy really doesn't work. Okay, um, you know, most of these other conditions, systemic uh, therapy is probably still going to be a part of the uh, treatment solution. With digital termitis or hairy heel, it's not. Uh, we just don't see response. It's not a systemic issue. It's a outside of the top layer of skin issue. So the systemic antibiotics really don't get into the tissue, the epidermis of the skin to be able to treat and cure this issue. So what, we're, what we have to rely on is topical therapy. Uh, so topical therapy, whether that's an antibiotic solution, uh, we can use formalin, copper tox, 
Uh, there's a lot of different products that we might uh, might utilize. Um, you know, things like formalin or copper tox, uh, and, you know, there's been situations for to increase the effectiveness of treatment and to be able to clean that foot, they actually put some of these solutions in a uh, garden pump spray. And to be able to spray that hoof, hoof off, uh, it will dry, it will, it will help heal from the outside. And that's exactly what we want. Uh, if we do use any type of antibiotic powder, sometimes some folks will uh, try to put a bandage on it, just a quick little wrap. If we do that, we need to make sure it comes off in a couple of days. Um, so it's, uh, it's in the environment, it is contagious, it takes a long time to see lesions, uh, but it's good to understand that if we do see some of these lesions, topical therapy is really warranted. Okay, um, let's finish up here. I don't wanna keep you all too long, be happy to answer questions here in a little bit, but uh, let, let's finish up with just a few other uh, oddball things. Uh, lacerations or entrapments, so to speak. Uh, lacerations happen. Uh, whether they get wrapped up in some wire, whether they get cut, uh, regardless of, of where it happened, sometimes we need to try to isolate where it happened, especially if it came from our working facility or our, uh, or our trailer. Uh, how many of you have taken a look at the floor of your stock trailer lately? Okay, making sure there's no sharp areas, making sure there's no rotten floor. It's always a good thing to do, especially before turnout, to make sure that our equipment, even our trailers are kind of up to spec to be able to handle these animals, okay? Uh, and often we can see wire or baling string or baling wire wrapped around a hoof. Uh, one of the more entertaining one, ones, I was talking with a producer and this calf got a, uh, actually walked through an old uh, uh, oil filter. So the oil filter off a, uh, whether it was off a pickup or a tractor, somehow got its whole hoof through that and got stuck in any way, it caused an infection. So uh, one of the things that we'll look for if there's wire or anything stuck on a hoof, and it's like, oh, it's a regular foot rot. Well, if we see this clear delineation, okay, that clear line where we almost have two bumps, should kind of yield that, hey, I wonder if something stuck around that foot, okay? And so th this, this would be a situation if we just treated it as foot rot and we didn't remove that obstruction, and uh, obviously these aren't going to heal. So uh, it's always worth a second look on, is it foot rot or is it something else? Because uh, it could be something very simple, like a piece of wire wrapped around that hoof. And it's amazing how tight those can get around those, hoof, uh, those hooves. Uh, so something to keep in mind. Once we get those cleaned out, uh, maybe maybe some uh, antimicrobial therapy, but really it's, it's removing the nidus and cleaning them up uh, and they, they can heal pretty quickly. Last but not least, Okay, stifled animals, okay, uh, stifle is our knee, okay, people, it's, it would be our knee uh, on the back leg, and the stifle is up here right at the body, and as if you can notice, this is a little bit swollen, the animal's kind of dragging it, um, stifle injuries are most commonly associated with our bulls, our breeding bulls, or even our cows, if they're cycling and they're riding each other, this is usually a, a riding injury, the one that, that is doing the riding. Um, so this is actually a cranial cruciate ligament tear. Uh, the cranial cruciate is the same as people's ACL. Okay, if you yourself or know somebody that blew out their ACL, this is what cattle do. Is they we just call it the cranial cruciate, uh, but it, but it is the same uh, same ligament. It's inside the joint, inside the knee, inside that that stifle, and that's actually what tears. And unfortunately, when cattle tear it, they have a uh, their hock and their stifle are supposed to flex at the same time. And whenever they tear this ligament, they also tear that uh, suspensatory ligament as well. So basically it, it, almost, it can almost look like their leg is broken because their, uh, their hock will flex separately from its stifle. And it's, it kind of freaks you out the first time you see it. Very painful right after it happens. Um, but again, they can go back to walking on it uh, sometimes. We will see moderate uh, swelling right around that stifle. Uh, usually it's our bulls that come up lame and they just don't want to ride. They lay over by themselves in a thicket. They don't want to get out. When you do get them out, they're very lame. Um, so again, the hock and the stifle, stifle will flex independently. Okay, no huge blown up major swelling. If we have major swelling, we think a broken leg. Okay, but it's usually isolated just around that joint. Um, so mild to no, but can still, sometimes they, they will still place their foot. 
place their foot down. They just don't want to, whenever they put pressure, it slides around and causes pain. So they'll still place it. They just don't want to put a whole lot of pressure on it. Uh, so again, stifle animals are something we definitely want to keep an eye on for, especially coming into the breeding season. Uh, keeping an eye on our bulls, making sure we get our bulls up and moving, just uh, addressing any other issues, to make sure that they're still fit and performing out in the pasture. And stifled animals is something we would definitely keep an eye on for. So uh, with that, I'll finish up. Uh, I'm glad everybody uh, was able to get logged in today. Hopefully you were able to pick up a few uh, nice pieces of information or at least as a good reminder uh, to really readdress and take a closer look at some of our lameness issues out in the pasture this summer. Because uh, more than likely it affects us all. Uh, you know, we, we traditionally will see a, a few lameness issues during the summer months. We have the moisture, they're covering a lot of ground. Uh, so it's a good idea to keep these in the, in the back of your mind. And when you see something, taking a closer look, if it's a little bit more sinister than just regular foot rot, making that call to your veterinarian sooner as opposed to later to make sure we can get some adequate therapy uh, to really get down to the, the true cause to hopefully get them all back to production. So with that, I'll, I'll send, it, send it back over. Okay, thanks, AJ. Um, that was a really good presentation. Uh, does anybody on, uh, on right now, do they have any questions? Okay, AJ, I do have one uh, for you. Uh, as far as stifle injuries go, is there anything that producers can do to try to either um, help them heal from that injury uh, if they get one? Um, I see it pretty commonly in bulls uh, as well, so I was just curious. So unfortunately, the way that the, uh, the joints line up, once they tear, they will form scar tissue over time. If you put them in a smaller pen where they aren't moving around a whole lot, uh, they will scar over where they can be mobile. The issue is that scar tissue does not have the tensile strength of what the tendon did. Um, so, okay. that, you know, so once they tear it, they're never going to be the same again. So I, that that's okay. important to just upfront. Um, if it's a very valuable animal, very valuable bull, there are there is actually a surgical repair that can be done. So okay. that surgical repair, even a 2,500 pound bull, they have pretty good success about fixing that stifle. Uh, those are, you know, it's it, it's fairly expensive for you know for maybe not every bull out there, but uh, sure. but it, especially if the genetic merit warrants it, or if this animal is going to be collected, or if they're you know, any of those, there, there are some options to be able to fix that. Uh, however, uh, you know, that's not for every animal. Those, those are done, you know, more at teaching hospitals and things like that. Uh, sure. but, but they can be repaired similar, uh, similar to how people uh, get their ACL repair. Uh, right. Now, if we leave them, you know, I talked about scar tissue. So if we leave those bulls for long periods of time, if they uh, blew out their stifle right at the beginning of breeding season, Okay. If we brought them out, we kept them in a, you know, a small pen, we fed them, just let them hang out, uh, you know, will it heal? Well, healing is kind of relative. It will scar over, okay? It will scar over where they can be mobile. Now, you know, some, you know, and people have tried, it's like, well, yes, it tore, it scarred over, he's been moving really well, I'm going to try to breed some more animals with him. Right. Um, it, which is a potential. However, it's a ticking time bomb. They could breed one animal and tear it again completely or could go the whole season. Okay, so it's very unpredictable um, on whether they can heal. Typically, once they've uh, blown an ACL, they're, they're done. Uh, they've lost their, uh, their fitness, okay? Their, their athletic fitness, after they, they've torn that, they're basically done. Um, except for some of those unique situations, if you you know need to heal them up because you want to get some straws collected on them or some things mm -hmm. like that, you know that's fine. Uh, but but it is pretty devastating for some of those animals, and it all has to do with the weight, the pure volume that they're holding, and the way that those joints come together. They don't line up like this; they're already flexed, and because they flex and there's always strain on that joint, it slides. 
it will constantly oh, slide okay. and be uh, unable to be able to uh, uh, perform. So I kind of hits home for me because I don't have an ACL in my right knee. I got hit by a bowl. And uh, of course, here we're talking about bulls blowing their ACL. Well, a bull right. blew out mine. Um, and I, yeah, it, actually, it, it's still not in there. And it flexes around every so often. But I, I can get by because I walk on two feet instead of all four. <laughs> right. OK. Good. Yeah. Thanks, Doc. You bet. Um, anything else from anybody question wise? Okay, it looks like uh, Brett did put the link to the uh, to the survey in the chat. Um, if you guys want to take the time to uh, fill out just kind of your thoughts on on uh, this week's program, we'd sure appreciate that. And uh, thank everybody for. Uh, spend a little time with us this morning. I am going to uh, kick it back over uh, to Lish, I think, to, uh, to wrap us up this morning. And let me see if I can't pull up um, the PowerPoint again. Um, we do have a program next week that's really interesting. Um, it has to do with um, blue algae and ponds and some of the research that they're um, working on right now. Um, so that will be a really interesting program that's coming up. Here, let me share my screen. Uh, it will be on Thursday, April 22nd. Um, green algae, sorry, not blue algae. Green algae studies and research with Jody Holthouse, Metalog District livestock agent. She's been doing a lot of um uh research on this so it should be a great um program especially with all of the algae issues that we do have in our ponds around kansas so we hope to see you next week thank you for attending and of course if you do want a copy of this recording or know anybody who would be interested in a copy feel free to get rid of uh, get a uh, hold of any of us agents and we would be happy to give it to you Thank you and have a great day. Thank you.